Hi, this is Mark DePristo, the CEO of Big Hat Biosciences. I'm going to walk you through a talk I gave at the European Society for Human Genetics called A Guide to Deep Learning in Healthcare. This talk covers two ba basic areas. One is the essentials of machine learning and deep learning so that you can understand the second part, which is a variety of examples of how those techniques are being applied throughout healthcare from medical imaging to molecular design. I've been working at the intersection of computer science and uh, bio for about 20 years now. I uh, got my undergrad in computer science and math and went to the University of Cambridge where I got a PhD in biochemistry and came back to Harvard where I spent three years doing an experimental evolution on the beta-lactamase system. Uh, after that, I joined the Broad Institute as start of the next-gen sequencing revolution and created the GATK uh, map reduce framework uh, for analyzing next-gen sequencing data that's uh, very widely used uh, with over 20,000 citations. Um, after that, I uh, moved to a small startup called Synaptics looking for biomarkers of autism in the blood, um, which ultimately led me to Google and the Google Brain team where I founded and ran um, the genomics team in what's now known as Google AI. And we, uh, among other things, created a tool called Deep Variant there, which is a open source uh, suite of software for analyzing next-gen sequencing that uh, learns how to do that task using deep learning. Um, and I have a variety of relevant publications in this area. Some subset are, are listed here below. Um, this section of the talk is really intended to to give you the conceptual understanding of how machine learning works and how deep learning extends upon those ideas of machine learning uh, so that it makes sense why uh, people are so excited about the application of deep learning and AI tech into healthcare. All, all work in machine learning really starts with data. So let's take a moment to walk through uh, all the terminology around data and, and really understand what data sets look like. And, and we'll talk about a very concrete data set here, which is with the IRIS data set. Uh, this is a classic machine learning data set from Ronald Fisher, actually quite old from 1936. Um, but it has all the essential features that you need to, to, to understand really everything about data sets. Uh, first, the, the data sets really, you know, a bunch of, it's really a table. It's got a bunch of rows, which we call records or examples. And it has uh, a whole bunch of columns that are divided into two sort of fundamentally different types of, of columns. One is the set of things that are features. These are also uh, essentially the inputs for machine learning. And there's a, a subset of those uh, columns that are, are called labels or outputs. These are things that you wish to predict. And so if we look at uh, you know, the IRS data set, I've taken three rows from uh, around 150 total records in the whole data set um, to give you a sense of what this looks like. So there's four features in this data set. There's uh, the sepal and the petal widths and lengths. These tell you something about the shape and the geometry of the, of the petal, uh, of the flowers that you see on the different types of irises. And, there's a, an output label here, which is the class. Which species really are we talking about? There's three in the data set. There's the setosa, the versicolor color, and the virginican. Uh, there's you know pictures of these on the right. Um, you can see there are different species. They're pretty similar looking, but you can clearly differentiate them. Um, and so this is a data set where the challenge is to go from the sepal lengths and widths and the petal lengths and widths and use that to predict which species you're looking at. And you have N of 150 observations to do that. And there are four features. So you would say this is an N of 150 with a P of four data set. So as I said earlier, the, the, the purpose of, of the IRS data set here is to let us predict the true species of a new observed flower, uh, given only measurements of its flower shape. And so the goal here from machine learning perspective is to take a subset of the data, train it on that subset of data so that we can predict the species of novel flower. So let, let's walk in the sort of from the outside in here. So let's talk about the inference stage. What, what is inference doing? So on the bottom here, you have a novel example. It, you don't know the actual species here. So it's a sort of a bunch of question marks. 
And but you can measure the the four key properties of the flower here. So we have you know 6.4, 3.2, 4.7, 1.5. And you're going to add that to this machine learning function we've learned called f hat of x. And we feed that in as the x's. And we want f hat to give us back a prediction for what is the true species here. And, and here I have an example where it's predicted the ver very color species. So that's ultimately the goal of the machine learning algorithm, to take novel examples, feed them through this algorithm, and have it emit the you know, accurate predictions of the true label. So how do you do that? So that's on the top. So what you're doing is you're taking a subset of the data. So this is um, you know, some of the rows and all of the columns in this scenario. And we're going to send it through some training scheme. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And we're trying to teach a machine learning algorithm that to predict the Ys from the Xs here. So we're learning a model f hat of x that predicts the output label. In machine learning, it's important to understand the concept that good features lead to good predictors. So what that means is that, you know, in the original data set, I had all these green columns, four columns, that were the raw observed data. Now, somebody went out and measured all of those dimensions of the flower petals, and, and they may have decided to do that based on what they thought would be useful for predictions. But that may not be the most natural way of doing the using the data to make predictions. It also may not have, it may, they may have measured things that turn out to be not useful. And so there's a variety of things that fall into the bucket of feature engineering and selection that are, that are critical to understand for the practice of machine learning. One is um, you need to remove irrelevant features. And so what this means is in, in, in this particular example, suppose the petal length actually just doesn't meaningfully relate to the species. So you would go through and use like a statistical test of some form to identify the petal length as not being related to the actual species, the, the output that you're trying to predict, and you would remove it from the data that you use to train your model. And the reason for doing that is simply to remove irrelevant and distracting data that make it harder for the model to learn. Another common thing to do is so-called feature engineering as opposed to selection where you do typically two things. You normalize your data. So I give an example here where we've normalized the sepal length. And what I mean by this is the sepal length isn't centered at zero, right? This is some measurement of, uh, of, a, of a length in centimeters. And so uh, she, the mean value is likely around five in the data set. And, and oddly enough, the, the fact that the mean value is centered away from zero can sometimes in, in, impede different machine learning algorithms. So it's very common to transform things by normalizing them. So that, for instance, the mean is, is at zero and the variance within the, the column is, is standardized. And you, you know, many ways of doing this. I give an example here of a z-score normalization. Um, which just gen tends to help the models learn. And, and you can all do all sorts of transformations of your data to, to make it easier to work with, in particular, and easier to learn on. The, the other thing that you commonly see are so-called synthetic features. These are, are, are features that a human has injected, you know, expert knowledge into the system and say, you know, actually, I want to have this complex feature that's derived from a, a couple of other features. And maybe and maybe actually a very computationally sophisticated way, and that actually I want that data to be sent into the machine learning model. And, and in this example, I'm giving a, a relatively trivial example of just summing the the sepal and the petal widths as a as a new synthetic feature, and and that has the attraction of both uh, allowing you to inject expertise into the system, or if you can create new features that you think are going to be more useful, and send them into the machine learning algorithm to make use of, and you you can also um, clean up your data through some type of normalization. And then finally, you can remove features that are irrelevant. So you have this canonical process in machine learning where you have an original raw data set. It's sort of right off of disk or what you actually observed. And then there's a variety of transformations applied to that feature selection to eliminate features you don't like, as well as normalization and, and, and synthetic feature creation that lead to uh, a series of uh, really a derived data table or data frame that's the actual inputs to the, the machine learning uh, training and, and, and actual prediction systems. So here we're going to dive right into how machine learning algorithms really work. And, and we're, we're, we're going to assume that all the feature engineering and selection is already done. Somebody has given us a table of data that we are supposed to learn from. 
And really the goal there is to take the input features, uh, trans build a mathematical function that compute goes from those input features to a prediction of, of what type of flower it is. And in order to simplify things, I've, I've made the problem easier. I binarized the output. So here we're trying to just predict if something is a setosa or if something is not a setosa. So you see roughly a third of the data is a positive setosa, which is in blue here, or not a setosa in red. And I do that because I also do something simple and common here, which is I'm just going to simplify the problem further by only considering two of the four features. So here we're just going to look at the sepal length and width. And I'm doing that largely because visualizing four dimensional data is extremely difficult. And, and the purpose of this is, is not to make the best predictor, but to give you an intuitive sense of how this works. So let's really focus on this lower left figure. So you have uh, the sepal length and sepal width on the X's and Y's. You have the blue uh, points that are from true setosas and the reds are not setosas. And you can see there's a, a, a fundamental difference here between the circles and the crosses. The circle data set is the, the data points that we're going to use to train the model. And we've kept some fraction of the data in the full data frame held out as test data, and we're going to use that to evaluate the quality of our model. So we're not going to show the machine learning algorithms during training that data, but we're going to hold it out and use it as an unbiased estimator. And that's in, in the blue crosses. And this is just done randomly uh, in this scenario. So the goal here is to take the blue circles and the red circles, build a model, and then we'll evaluate that on the on the crosses. And, and on the right, I show a very simple one layer of neural network learning on the on the circle data. Uh, it produces this dividing line in, that is in white, separating the blue region and the red region. The red region are all the points in space that it believes would be um, not a setosa. The blue region of space indicates all the areas that are going to be flagged as setosas. And then the fact that the vast majority of the blue crosses and the red crosses are in the right color domains tells you that it's doing a very good job at learning this function, but it's not perfect. There is one blue point that's you know far on the lower left here that it gets wrong. And, and that's an example of the challenge of there are no other points near it in space down there. It had a hard time learning. It built a relatively simple model that was a, looks mostly like a separating line. And, and because of that, it, it does make a mistake. Um, and so the key thing to really appreciate here is that what you're essentially doing is learning how to divide these two groups of points in space. You're looking for a dividing line that separates the two groups. And that is the key goal of the machine learning algorithm, to separate data in space in these feature dimensions. The reason machine learning is so exciting uh, is not because it's the only method that lets you build classifiers like this. There's many uh, approaches that, that work from statistics for, uh, for pure mathematical modeling in general. Um, but the thing that differentiates machine learning from everything else really is that it's extremely data-driven general purpose method. And so I, I hope that this slide highlights why that's both exciting and, and, and important. Um, as I said before, you know, I took two of the four features and plotted them and used them for the inputs for a classifier. Of course, that leaves many more combinations. I could take different sets of two, which I've done here. You know, if we start on the, the lower left, this is petal length versus petal width. The middle one is petal length versus sepal width now, and, and the top is sepal length versus petal width. And you can see that they have very different distribution of points in space. The Nevertheless, the blue and the red points are pretty well separated no matter how you do it. But the the position of those clusters in space means that when you're building a classifier for differentiating them, you need to be able to learn how to separate points in space in really ar relatively arbitrary ways. And I showed you know, two different types of, of modeling algorithms. They're both neural networks, but they differ in how deep their hidden layers are. One of them has essentially the, the smallest you could possibly have, which is only one hidden layer. But you can, of course, grow this out. So the, the two hidden layer version has more capacity. It can build more sophisticated dividing lines between the points. And the thing that's amazing about the machine learning algorithms is that you, since they're purely data driven here, you just feed the X pairs, regardless of what features they are, into the algorithm and tell it to learn. And then you get different dividing lines that it learns based purely on the data that's there. And you can see that 
if we focus on, for instance, the single hidden layer neural network in the beginning, this requires the machine learning algorithms to build a classifier that looks materially different. If you focus on the dividing lines, you can see that the shape of the dividing line is very different between the two groups, the orientation, which means that it's learned the essential properties of how to separate these things and manage to divide, draw excellent dividing lines between the groups. And in fact, you can do this with nearly perfect accuracy in regardless of what features you take. And so this frees you in many ways, if you think about the contrast between you know, pure Bayesian modeling or mathematical modeling approaches, where you have to have a, a mathematical expression that requires you to really understand the relationship between your input variables and your output variables here. We don't need that. And it's not obvious that we could construct it. I have no idea what the mathematical relationship is between the sepal length, the petal width, and the species of a flower. But the machine learning algorithms are very happily consuming this data, nevertheless, and building quite strong and, 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 and high quality predictors off of it. And so it frees you from that, that challenge and that you know, potentially intractable problem of building a a generative model that relates your inputs to your outputs and simply says, can I build robust classifier regardless of my understanding of that? I'm just going to model the data right off the data itself, as opposed to inject a large amount of, of, of sort of mathematical understanding of the problem in. So there's some cost to doing that, but the in exchange for those costs, you get enormous freedom to just focus on collecting the data and trying to build strong classifiers off the raw data in and of itself. The reason that's so important is that not all separable distributions can be done, can be separated with a simple line. And you can see that here in, in, in four representative examples of distributions that are obviously separable. There's no question that you can identify what points belong to red and what point belong to blue. But None of these are done, can be done easily with a single straight line. And so in order to separate these types of distributions, what you have to do is warp the X and Y points in a way that actually makes a single line separate the two. And so deep neural networks can learn how to do that warping given enough data so that the classification problem can be very accurate. So how do those neural networks actually learn to draw those lines? And uh, this is a figure from the uh, Guide to Deep Learning Healthcare Review that really tries to convey, and I think does an excellent job of explaining the, the fundamentals of what's happening. So uh, on the left here, this is now a very abstract problem. You have this green distribution and this and orange distribution. And the goal is to, to separate the green from the orange. And, and you can see that uh, they're, they're, not, they're obviously separable, but they're not, there's no like easy line that divide the group. And so the neural network is effectively taking the input data and warping it through a series of relatively simple mathematical operations as you go from each layer of the network. And as the network becomes deeper, more and more transformations are applied. And so here you can see the input data is in this very clean kind of XY grid. After going through the first layer, it's a little bit warped. It goes through another layer, it gets even more warped. And finally, that warped surface is sent into the output layer, which is essentially trying to draw a line, a straight line through the green and orange region that separates the two. And it's, uh, it can be a simple line because it's essentially pushing the learning of how to do the warping down into the lower layer such that the uh, a line can be drawn to separate the two groups. And so there's a couple of things that are worth appreciating about that that are, that are super powerful. One is this warping is learned dynamically by, by the machine learning algorithm here. And in particular, it's learned as for the fit for purpose reason of separating orange from green for the output. So the warping is problem specific. So that if you change the output, you might get a very different warping. It learns, and this is why people say it learns features. It learns how to change the inputs in a way that make the features easy to, to classify the two groups. And the deeper the network gets, the more powerful it is at doing those warpings. Of course, the more data it needs to do them well. But it really is the logic of what is happening under the hood in, in neural networks and in, 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 deep, in really deep neural networks, you have an enormous amount of warping, which is corresponding to essentially a large amount of feature engineering uh, 
of the input feature space. So all of that has been a discussion of, of pretty generic machine learning. And, and now is the really the start of talking about deep learning. And, and, and the reason I brought up all the earlier things about data and machine learning and neural networks and data space warping was that it really sets the stage to understand the now one step uh, extension that brings you into deep learning. And so unlike the stuff that I was doing before with the neural nets that had, were very shallow, they only had one or two hidden layers, deep learning is really just the observation that if you add a lot of layers, each of which has a lot of learning capacity in it, um, you can learn incredibly complicated functions that uh, off very, very rich and complex data types, you know, anything from complex, you know, X-ray images to temporal inputs to, in fact, just arbitrary multimodal inputs that are combinations of, of any number of other types of data. And the depth of these networks means that they are able to do lots and lots and lots of very rich feature transformations, that so-called space warping that I was talking about, to that makes them be able to learn very, very complex functions for classification purposes. And it's so deep that these networks that we actually talk not about feature engineering or selection, but really feature learning in the networks. The networks is deep enough that the later layers start to represent new types of features, similar to what we said that humans beings would do. They would make synthetic new features. Here, what we're seeing is the network is essentially doing that. And this is essentially automating the process of feature engineering, which is very much an art and not a science. And so the deep learning breakthrough really is one of not needing to worry quite as much about your features anymore, because we now have a technology that can take really raw inputs and do its own type of feature engineering automatically in a fit for purpose way, just like earlier machine learning algorithms could do that for the classification problem were hugely dependent on the quality of their input features. That is the immensely practical leap in capabilities that the deep learning systems have made uh, you know, over the last five or 10 years. So just to hammer that home, I'm gonna show uh, one of my favorite visualizations of what deep learning neural networks are, are, have learned from image classification problems. And this is uh, an image taken from Ola's uh, feature visualization publication in 2017. And it's showing the, the things that GoogleNet, which is a very deep uh, convolutional neural network for image classification, learns when you train it on the ImageNet data set, which is teaching, you know, has, has 300 by 300 images that have labels like there's a dog here, there's a cat, there's a motorcycle, there's a tick. Um, so you train that over these millions of images. And then you ask, well, what, what do these layers in the network kind of see? What are they responding to? And what you see is that it essentially learns high level features. As you move deeper into the network, you learn more and more sophisticated things. In the beginning, you're looking at edges and orientations, it becomes sort of textures and patterns in the middle, all the way to the right where you're learning essentially the object structure. And you can think of Google Net's ability to learn to differentiate cats versus dogs is really that it has learned how to create all these intermediate features at each layer. It's learning how to build up more complicated features so that the problem of saying if there's a dog and the cat in the image is actually becomes this relatively simple linear separation problem at the very end of the network, because it has been able to separate the cat versus dog data so much in space that it becomes a relatively simple classification problem at the very end of the network. One of the things that makes machine learning so exciting as a technology these days is how incredibly accessible it, it actually is. Um, with tools like Python and, and all of the libraries built on top of it, you know, Pandas, uh, Scikit-learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch, it is possible to get involved with real machine learning algorithms um, relatively straightforwardly. And, and, and I thought I would illustrate that here with a real working code in Python that loads the Iris data set. It, it rescales and does some feature transformations. It binarizes the outputs. It does the splitting into training and test 
It builds on multi-layer perceptron, which is the same thing as a neural network here. It fits that to the training data. It assesses the accuracy on the test data, and it prints out that it's learned a classifier that's got perfect accuracy on this data set using all four features. And that the fact that that code can fit on a single slide tells you, um, I think it really shows you how accessible the technologies have become. You know, these uh, would only become marginally more complicated if you wanted to start making really deep neural networks, started using PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, the fundamental thing to appreciate really is that although you might hear in the, this, this general perception that machine learning and AI tech in particular requires enormous scale and huge compute, I mean, GPUs and specialized hardware, you know, this is true um, only in, 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 the, in extremists. They, when you're really working on the largest data sets that we have that are really required to make progress on, on certain types of problems. For the vast majority of problems that I've encountered, you can make uh, pretty good progress with smaller data sets that are much more accessible. And you can learn an enormous amount about how you should approach larger scale machine learning, and, you know, even on your laptop. With, with all that uh, background on machine learning under our belt, uh, I'm going to finally transition into the true topic of this talk, which is the Guide to Deep Learning in Healthcare. It's a, an overview of a review article in Nature Medicine uh, I contributed to last year. Uh, I would recommend if you want to know the uh, details of everything to jump into the review. So I'm going to give a, a kind of a high level overview focused on the, the, the key figures from that paper. Before we dive into specific examples, I, I think it's worth talking through at a high level why why people are so excited about bringing AI ML technologies into healthcare today. And I think it arises from three uh, basic features of the healthcare and in the AI ML landscape. One is that um, we appreciate that the data in healthcare is both large, it's growing, and it's super complex. It spans everything from you know, your personal history, your family history, to diagnostic tests, to your visits to your physician, both at your primary care up into the hospital. And so we have this enormously large amount of data about people relevant to their health. We know, though, that the relationship between all of that data and, and your actual health outcomes, you know, whether you're going to have a heart attack in the next five years, or you're at risk for diabetes, or what uh, drug would be the best to treat, uh, say, high cholesterol, um, is very unclear. It's, it, there's a very, very complex process that goes from your genetics, your environment, the things we measure about your environment over time, and the actual health outcomes you experience. And so learning how to do those predictions is extremely challenging from first principles. So we kind of need to rely on the data to do it. Uh, and finally, because of the difficulty of doing that, and, and really the difficulty in particular of building what I would think of as, as, as sort of mathematical models that go up from the basic things we can observe about your health to your long-term health risks or, or different treatment options, it tells you that AI ML tech has a really good chance to see significant improvements in our ability to relate data to health outcomes across the whole field, in large part because our previous ability to do that was largely limited by uh, our ability to build those models and choose relevant features, which is precisely the things that deep learning tech uh, provides to us these days. So let's start at uh, where I think almost any discussion of AI and healthcare should start, which is the medical imaging field, which is, I think, widely regarded as the first killer application of AI tech in healthcare. And I'll walk through the figure in a little bit of detail. It should be pretty familiar from the earlier pictures of the Google Net uh, and image classification descriptions I was talking about earlier. But here, instead of feeding ImageNet and in labels that look like dogs and cats and motorcycles and ticks, here we're taking medical imaging data as the input. And here, you know, you can see on the left, you know, a span from uh, pathology slide images to retina to skin pictures to you know X-rays of your chest going through a long and deep uh, convolutional neural network similar to Google Net with uh, a goal to classify useful medical insights for that sort of hidden away in those in that data. So an example would be in the pathology slide, you might ask, uh, is there cancer at all in the slide? 
Um, if there is cancer, which cells are indicative of cancer? What type of cancer is there? Is there uh, any kind of molecular features we might learn just from seeing images of the, of the cell? So all those questions are sort of accessible to this uh, machine learning technology uh, that we are able to apply here. Um, but that doesn't really answer the question of why it's, why it's the killer app. Um, in my view, there's really three things that make this such a, a compelling area. One is that deep learning uh, tech arose in image classification. Uh, the big, I think, big breakthroughs all originated in image in learning about images and even ImageNet, in particular, uh, was a was a key area to sort of see the breakthrough in terms of accuracy. And so, what that meant on a, on a kind of practical level was that we had systems in place early on that learned how to do deep learning on images. Um, we had very good uh, starting points for how to train those images. And because of that, we were able to bootstrap into this field very, very quickly. You could uh, take an image and send it through a neural network that had already been validated to some degree on its ability to learn and ImageNet and say, focus then on the specific issues of medical imaging as opposed to both trying to do medical imaging and deep learning research simultaneously. Um, two, I think another factor is, as you can see in this figure, uh, imaging is very common modality in healthcare. We take pictures of lots of different things and interpret them. Uh, so that rich and diverse data type meant that you saw many individual teams grab a hold of a specific data type and run very deep into it. So there's very uh, quite, a, quite a deep uh, research uh, literature on each one of these data types. You could uh, do a whole bunch of work in, in understanding cancer pathology slides while your colleagues worked on retinal imaging or dermatology challenges. And, and you didn't really step on each other's toes too much uh, because the applications were so different despite having a very common application. So you saw sort of a, an explosion of applications in the field uh, which is one reason that it's, it's so prevalent. And then finally, uh, because imaging is so common in medical uh, in the medical profession, uh, there's actually pretty large data sets that are relatively accessible uh, in this space. And so, you know, the combination of sort of being able to start easily from deep learning research on uh, non-medical images, the uh, diversity of different types of applications, and the relative ease of getting those large data types, I think, are, are really why this is such a killer application for AI and healthcare. The, the next major application area after you get past uh, medical imaging and, it, and its very large number of applications is, is an area of uh, interpreting electronic medical records, which is in my view, uh, you know, a very exciting emerging application, but certainly much less mature than medical imaging applications. And I'll, I'll walk through the figure from the paper because I think it's, it, it really helps understand you know, what the challenge is here. So um, whether we like it or not, you know, electronic medical records are, are not a very well structured data type. Um, you have very different uh, representations at different hospitals, uh, very different types of, of Im information is captured both in a structured way in some cases, but often in unstructured notes. So you want to uh, take that data across many institutions and, and harmonize it into a common fo uh, for format. So there's here the FHIR format as an example of this, um, which ideally gives you at least a, a structural representation that's consistent across the healthcare systems. And you can turn that uh, sort of more structured uh, data into uh, what is a, effectively a temporal sequence of events. You know, at this point in time, you know, Mark went into the hospital and got a blood draw or Mark went in for his annual physical. And that series of events uh, can uh, get comes both at you know specific times with notes associated with and potential lab values um, associated with things that were ordered there. And, and that temporal sequence event is really the, the actually, in some sense, feature engineered data that we're going to send into these high end AI classifiers. And, um, these are actually typically models that are not uh, so much like the deep neural nets uh, that I talked about before, these convolutional networks for imaging, but really um, temporal networks like an LSTM or transformer network these days. And the goal of these uh, systems is to take all those events and learn how to answer quite complicated questions about the uh, properties of the individuals based on their events, their likely future trajectories, and, and the potential value for interventions. 
And so a good example of this is we have you know, early evidence that it's possible to train models here that are able to answer questions like, um, what parts of the patient's past history should be reviewed? Are there things that are missing or things that look like unusual outliers, which can be very useful? Um, two, you know, you, the, and this is really a, a super powerful thing if you, when you think about it in detail. Um, because these models can answer questions about the future, make predictions about what, uh, what may happen, uh, you can use that to kind of reverse engineer. Well, what, what would you most like to know today to help you disambiguate what's likely to happen tomorrow? And that allows you to prioritize in a you know, data-driven and, and, and somewhat automated fashion the, the guidance of, of capturing additional data about patients. Um, finally, you know, kind of, I guess the flip side of that question is, is really the one of, well, as opposed to collecting more data, you know, are there things that we should do to intervene? This would be a you know, classic example of, you know, is there good evidence that uh, if we discharged a patient today that they would um, come back within the next 24 hours? Maybe we should intervene to keep them overnight instead. Maybe we should put them on a statin because there's good evidence that that would benefit them based on all their lab work. Um, and then finally, as I was implying, you know, the underlying data here and the underlying models and their predictions are really about the future trajectories. Uh, in these temporal sequences. And so you can kind of compute all sorts of useful properties about those predictions, about what are your most like, what are the risks that are most significant? What would be the best way for you to reduce those risks? And uh, this is wildly promising because I'm sure as everyone knows, this is very hard uh, stuff to reason about as a lay person, let alone uh, have a, a serious conversation with your often very busy doctor, particularly these days with, um, the pandemic raging. And so more automated ways of guiding health decisions is clearly something that we need to build out. Um, if only for our own uh, sanity and improvement of our own health state. Um, and of course, as this deploys out more broadly, we would expect to see you know, population level gains. Um, but you know, there are still many, many challenges to make these things uh, you know, real live applications and, and many people are working on them. And I would expect to see huge amounts of progress in this field in the next few years. Now we turn to uh, genomics, my uh, pet field for the last 10 years. Um, genomics in many ways are complementary to what we've talked about with medical imaging and electronic medical records so far. Uh, it is, uh, spans everything from basic science research all the way up to, you know, molecular diagnostics. Um, and it's been an exciting field for the last 10 years in large part because of the explosion of data that's been, we've been able to finally capture with next generation DNA sequencing instruments, which have um, reduced enormously the cost of sequencing DNA. Uh, it's now possible to go out and have your entire genome sequenced for under a thousand dollars. And we use that technology not just to sequence genomes, but to measure all sorts of interesting properties about how cells work. Uh, and we know that uh, all of those things sort of going up from your genome to how your cells work um, and how you're related to other individuals are all related to uh, important attributes of both development and, and your ultimate health. And what you see because of this is a huge number of, uh, of deep learning applications in this space. Uh, my uh, early love in this area was at the experimental data interpretation level, trying to really understand the output of those sequencers. And that's an area where deep learning is really uh, becoming increasingly entrenched uh, because of the large amounts of data and the extreme difficulty of, of interpreting it. Uh, but it goes all the way up from the uh, low-level data interpretation, you know, up into molecular diagnostics to the point where, you know, we have deep learning tools that can look at a, a new mutation in your genome and predict what the chances is being deleterious to you or causing a disease. And we can look at your genome and, and make uh, meaningful statements about your potential negative uh, side effects for taking different types of drugs. And so you can do what's called pharmacogenomics to uh, match you know, drugs to you based on your individual genes. And all of those things are things that we um, struggle to do with traditional methods and, and have at least a reasonable expectation that the deep learning tools will, will radically improve the quality of our ability to analyze these types of data. Finally, I, I want to talk about a, another application area that's actually outside of the, the scope of the original um, 
publication, a uh, guide to deep learning in healthcare, but is in fact uh, also well described in a very nice review in Nature Methods from Wang and Wu and Arnold, uh, which is an area that uh, my startup is, is very heavily involved in now, which is uh, the challenge of bringing AI technologies to improving our ability to design uh, molecules. And, and this is really an observation similar to the whole story before, which is that you know, AI ML tech is very, very good at making predictions. We want to design molecules that have novel properties. And previously, the only way we could do this was experimentally by following a, a, a scheme that you know, is, is basically, uh, well, one is it was a huge breakthrough when it came out and won a Nobel Prize for a so-called directed evolution from Francis Arnold. So uh, I don't want to diminish its value and it's, it's been transformative for 20 years, but over the time that we've been um, using it, you know, we've come to realize it has many, many limitations. Um, by far and away, the, the, the hardest thing there is that you don't really control the mutational process. You can't design upfront, you more like select and screen. And that's proved to be very, very difficult in designing, you know, increasingly challenging to design molecules. And so there's really a view that AI ML technology is going to revolutionize this area in large part because it, it changes the loop from one of a sort of experimental phishing to um, designing specific mutations based on the feedback from AI models that tell you what the likely outcome or, or likely effect of those mutations would be. And that AI guided uh, design step is it, it, you now see a reasonably large number of startups starting to apply it. Um, and I think there's a growing consensus that this is going to be uh, equally revolutionary in the field and are and making um, even more sophisticated designs finally within reach. So we've come to the end of the talk. I, I hope that there are, that you go away with at least four high level takeaways from the talk, which I'll enumerate here. Um, one is that machine learning is a very powerful toolkit for modeling how data relates to output, outputs that we care about. And it frees us from the challenge of building, you know, frankly, very difficult to build uh, mathematical models that relate the, the input data to these outputs. Um, and the deep learning revolution, which builds upon a very important work in, in classical machine learning, uh, has really been a revolution in the ability to further reduce the need for human kind of oversight in this. We are getting now to the point that we can both, uh, we can learn effectively classifiers uh, that relate data from the inputs to their outputs, but uh, even more importantly, we can do that when uh, we don't have the ability to engineer features that are super informative, but that we now have machines and, and technologies and techniques and algorithms that will go and actually not only build the classifiers, but also learn the features that are necessary to make those classifiers work well. And it's that lowering of the barrier, the sort of democratization of data modeling that I think is why you see such a huge explosion of deep learning uh, enthusiasm in the market. It's really making ultra high-end predictions accessible to many, many people. And that accessibility and the power of those techniques, when coupled with the rich data and, and frankly, insanely complex data that you see in healthcare, um, there's a hope that we finally have a technology toolkit that's able to take that data learn effectively on it and, and give us tools to answer questions that are very likely to improve our health in the next five to 10 years. And if anything I'd like people to take away is that we've just started on this. Deep learning tech is very new. You know, this is 10, maybe 15 years old. Uh, we've only really started doing the application into healthcare in, in, in maybe half of that duration. Uh, this is the time to get involved. There is a huge amount to be learned still, much more, maybe the best way to say that is, we've only we've learned a small fraction of all we have to learn here. So most of the problems, most of the insights remain to be learned. Um, it's not so hard. I hope the, the slide with the Python on it convinced you that you can get involved here relatively easily. And so this is the time to get involved. It's just starting, it's relatively accessible and we have more problems than we have people to work on them.
So I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, the invitation to speak at the European Society for Human Genetics, and uh, which gave me the content here. Um, and for anyone who is listening on YouTube uh, for taking the time to, to think about this problem. And uh, I wish you all the best.